on hearts filled with joy because there is an empty tomb. We come to you, Lord, filled with, with all of the hope and the joy and the promise that that empty tomb holds for us. To know that, that you live, that, that you are undefeatable. Lord, we come today to give you praise for your defeat of death your defeat of darkness, your defeat of sin. Your light has overcome the darkness in the world, and we are so great, Lord, grateful, grateful to, to, to be here in your presence, worshiping you. Lord, walk with us this day and every day. Help us to walk and, and see your resurrected presence walking beside us every moment. Because it is the truth that you live is why we are able to face the world in all of its struggles, in all of its pain. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the uh, scripture this morning is an Old Testament scripture. And I think we got it. Did we get it fixed just to do the couple of verses that I'm going to do? Because... These verses, see, it's Old Testament, and you're wondering, why, why are you preaching on an Old Testament scripture for Easter, you know? But, but there's a truth in this scripture that, that, that carries over into the New Testament. And that's what I wanted to share on, and that's what I wanted to preach about this morning. So we're just going to read a couple of short verses from Psalm 118. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, His steadfast love endures forever. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. That's the Word of God. For us, the people of God. Well, Easter's a, a, an odd Sunday to bring up Christmas, but uh, 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 this coming Christmas, the fifth edition of the movie Mission Impossible will be released in theaters nationwide. And, and you know, if you're as old as me, you remember the original Mission Impossible? Yeah. I know some of my buddies over here do. So that's, it ran from 1966 to 1973, and Peter Graves was Jim Phelps in, uh, in the original Mission Impossible. And, you know, this... Uh, TV series, it had an iconic beginning. I mean, uh, it, it, this be it began every show this way. The uh, 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 Phelps would find some sort of briefcase or a tape recorder or a phone booth, and there would be some tape message in it. And, and the message would go uh, something like, uh, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is, and then they would go on and give the details of the mission. And then it was end always with, and uh, as always, should you or any of your IM force be caught or killed, the secretary will disavow any knowledge of your actions. This message will self-destruct in five seconds. And uh, good luck, Jim. So, and, and, then, and, and then what was so cool, what we loved about it then, 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 then the tape recorder or the briefcase or the phone booth would just spontaneously combust, you know, and it was so cool, and they would launch into the, the music of uh, Mission Impossible, and the series would start. Well, there's something else, uh, maybe some of you know, but maybe some of you don't know. We live in the age of self-destructing messages. Uh, there's no hidden briefcases or, or special phone booths with these self-destructing messages. And these self-destructing messages aren't being sent to secret agents. Well, maybe some of them are. But really, what is happening, hundreds of millions of people are receiving these uh, uh, 
receiving, uh, uh, sending, and destroying these messages around the world every single day. There's new apps that you can put on your cell phone, your, your smartphone, your tablet, your computer. There's new apps that allow you to send a message that as soon as the person receives it and reads it, it will self-destruct. It will just disappear. It will vanish into the ether. It will be wiped off of the internet and there won't be any record of this message anywhere. Well, you can imagine, you know, the people that are wanting to use this are people that don't want to leave any tracks. They don't want to leave any evidence behind of what they might have said about, the, you know, and, and, and you know, high school kids are going to love this. You know, they can gossip about somebody, but then all the evidence about that gossip <laughs> will go away. No, I didn't say that. So, uh, but, but it can also be used for some pretty nefarious things as, as well, you know, and, uh, but... Uh, this is the kind of world that we live in now. And the most popular of these apps is called Snapchat. And that's the one that people seem to be using more than any to, to, to send these kinds of messages. And, you know, we just seem to be living in a day where uh, things are so temporary. Things can be so anonymous, things uh, uh, and, and self-destructing messages, you know, these sorts of things are, are more possible than ever. Yet on this Easter morning, this Easter morning, God is doing something that will last forever. This Easter morning, as every Easter morning, God is doing something that will resonate forever. You know, there are no Snapchats with God. They don't self-destruct and go away. They don't fade Amen. away. When Amen. God speaks, it is unerasable. And it lasts forever. The opening verse of Psalm 118 connects us with this enduring and deeply satisfying theme of the resurrection. The steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. I don't know, some of you may know this old song. I know it. There's an old song. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. New every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O oh Lord. Great is thy faithfulness. Well, that's the God who serves. His love endures forever. And, and that's the core of our Christian faith. The core of our Christian faith is that God is love. And that love is so strong... It can raise Jesus from the dead. That love is so strong, it can give you new life and bring you salvation. That love is so strong that it defeated sin and death once and for all, for all who believe. That kind of message is not going to disappear. The resurrection cannot be erased. Think about, think about this, how long this message has endured, how strong this enduring message is around the world. You know, there are 2.2 million Christians, excuse me, billion, 2.2 billion Christians in the world today. And every one of them today is celebrating Easter. Everyone is celebrating the resurrection all around the world, celebrating this event that happened. And they're not only celebrating it around the world today, we've been having this celebration for over 2,000 years. For over 2,000 years, we have been celebrating the resurrection of Christ. Now that is an enduring message. Yeah. Let's look. Let's look at one of the earliest written witnesses.
to the resurrection uh, uh, for us today. You know, uh, there, there were witnesses right away. There were there was testimonies and witnesses and, and, and oral witnesses to the resurrection as soon as it happened. But but one of the first written witnesses that we have is Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Uh, Paul wrote that letter 25 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's actually, it's an it's a earlier witness to the resurrection even than the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark, was, was the scholars think, was written probably 30 or 40 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But, but, but Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 25 years after Jesus was raised from the dead. And I want to read this to you from chapter 15. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Fallen asleep is how Paul used to talk about those uh, uh, believers who had died. So he would say, they've fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, says Paul, then to the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me. Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus, I need the battery, huh? And we need the battery because we are tape recording this, as we do always. So there will be a break in the, uh, in, in, the, uh, in, the in, in the sermon and on the tape when you look at it on YouTube. You know, all of our... Uh, all of our sermons are on YouTube and Facebook, so if you if you miss a Sunday, you can always catch it on uh, on, on YouTube or Facebook. So, all right, let's see. <coughs> Test. There I go. Yeah, <laughs> Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus happened three or four years uh, after Jesus' death and resurrection, you know. But now, he wrote this letter 25 years later. And 25 years later, he has not been silenced. 25 years later, he's still proclaiming that Christ is risen. He's still saying, there were 500 witnesses. Christ appeared to the 12 disciples and at least 500 people more. Christ is alive was Paul's message. You all know who John Bellucci is, or was, don't you? Yeah. John Bellucci was the actor, the comedian on Saturday Night Live. He died about 30 years ago. Think of what commotion there would be if somebody said today, John Bellucci is alive! You know, he's risen from the dead! You know, uh, some of us might cherish, oh, well, good, they're going to have some good new episodes of Saturday Night Live again. But, but you know, people, the, the people's reaction would be, you know, you're crazy. You're absolutely, and as a matter of fact, the, probably the cast of Saturday Night Live would, 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 would say you're crazy because some of the cast of Saturday Night Live is still alive, uh, though some have fallen asleep. Um, they're around. The cast is still around and say, no way, John Bellucci's dead, and anyone who says that he's alive has got to be crazy. And there, you know, you would hear that kind of response to that kind of message. Yet Paul asserts that there were over 500 witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And perhaps, but even still, Perhaps the most convincing evidence to me that Christ rose from the dead, that he is alive, are those lives that have been resurrected because of an encounter with the living Christ. 
Let's start with Paul himself. I want to give you some, some background about Paul. This is something else you may not have had that much information about or known that much. But, but you know, Paul really had it made. He was a part of the elite and upper crust of, of his day. He, his life, he lacked for nothing in his life. Uh, though he was born a Jew, he was also born a Roman citizen. And being a Roman citizen, that gave him extra special privileges that other people in that society and day and age didn't have. And Paul was a part of the educated elite. Paul was studied, he studied under Gamaliel. Gamaliel is one of the great uh, uh, rabbinical scholars who started a school in that day. It, 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 Gamaliel is mentioned in uh, the, the New Testament, and Gamaliel is actually in Jewish history and other places. He is noted and remembered as, as one of the great scholars who started one of the great schools uh, in uh, uh, Jewish. He was, he was the great grandson of Hillel, who was another important Jewish rabbi. And, and well, Gamaliel was not just this great scholar. He was the president of the Sanhedrin. He was in charge of the ruling council of Jerusalem, and uh, the, the, the Jewish ruling council. So, you know, this was a pretty big deal to get trained by, by this guy. You know, it's, it, I guess it would be like if, uh, you know, we were trained by someone high up in, the, in government today, the, the president or the, 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 uh, the speaker of the house or the, the president of the senate, these sorts of things. And of course, I think you also know that it was the Sanhedrin that gave Paul the authority to go into people's homes and to search out Christians. And if he found Christians, to have them arrested and hauled off to prison, and some of them were even executed. I'm giving you this background because I want you to see how Paul was connected. Paul had it all. He, had, he, he would have had the, the best kind of life that a person could have in that day and age because he was connected to the elite. He was extremely well educated. The, the biblical scholars say today the Greek that Paul wrote in, it's some of the best Greek that, that's around there. He, he perfect, educated, very well-schooled Greek. I mean, he was, Paul was the cream of the crop. Yet Paul had an encounter with Jesus Christ. He had an encounter with Jesus Christ that changed his life. And because of that, he decided to leave all of that behind. And I want you to hear the kind of life that Paul chose instead. From 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I have worked much harder been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Paul didn't have to expose himself to any of this, but he chose to. He chose to because he had an encounter with the living Christ that convinced him 
that Jesus was the Son of God, He was the Chosen One, He was the Messiah who was crucified, dead, and buried, and on the third day rose again and ascended into heaven. The risen Christ always brings new life. You know, the message that the risen Christ brings new life cannot be erased. It cannot be deleted. And Paul refused to allow that this message to be erased or deleted. He chose to put his life into action to give witness to the fact that Christ is alive and that Christ will make a difference in everybody's life who believes that Christ is alive and acts on that faith. Paul could not deny this fact no matter what trials or tribulations he faced. Many of you here know that in my sophomore, junior year in high school, I was living a pretty hedonistic lifestyle, not high school, college. A sophomore, junior year in college. I was living a pretty, pretty hedonistic lifestyle. I was living for myself. You know, and you know the scenario, drugs, sex, rock and roll, you know, I mean, that's, that's what we did, you know. I flunked out of college. I flunked out of college because of that lifestyle. I was so into myself and so much wanting to live the partying life that I didn't want to do the hard work that it took to stay in school. Today, however, Today I'm doing my best to, to live for Christ and to help Christ advance Amen. His kingdom. Amen. And I understand now, better than I did then, that life is not about me. Life is about God. And I understand better now that, that, that hardship is often the pathway to peace. To take a phrase out of Niebuhr's famous serenity prayer. You know, I may have flunked out of college in my junior year in college, but next month, I'm going to receive my doctor. <laughs> and I know I am not the only one here who has had a living encounter with Christ that has lifted them out of their darkness and despair and brought them into a new relationship with life, a new relationship in the light of Christ. I'm gonna, I, I just want to talk about a couple of people. Uh, uh, Billy is sitting over here. Billy's encounter with the love of God uh, allowed Billy to move into an apartment that she had. She, for years, Billy was on the streets. Now she's got her own apartment. Wave your hand, Billy. Yes, All right. <laughs> Ben's encounter with Christ. Ben, uh, 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 had, uh, when, after he met Christ, he decided, I'm going to come to Rise and Hope where I met him no matter what it takes. He was living in the shelter in D.C. He would get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, maybe earlier, I don't know. Yeah, okay. And to get on a bus, to get on the metro, to get on a bus, to be able to get here on Sunday morning. Because this is his community where he felt the love of God in Christ. And, 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 and Ben now not only uh, 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 is, is celebrating with us, but Ben's living with his daughter. He's got a place to live with his daughter. had an encounter with Christ that is leading Jeff into new leadership positions here within the church. Jeff is going to be heading up our Celebrate Recovery program, and Jeff is also the, uh, the uh, secretary at the church council meeting, and he's taking on these positions after 20 years in prison. You know, God works in such incredible ways in our lives if we just open ourselves up to the new life that God has for us. You know, so many of us here at Rising Hope are here because we have had an encounter with the living Christ. 
We are here because we've met Christ. And we see what Christ has for us. Christ has shown light into our darkness and is creating a pathway out for us so, so that we can move out into the world and be doing the good that God wants us to do in this community. Christ has not only revealed a new life to you, Christ is empowering you to lead that new life. You know, I know the stories of so many of you here. I know the stories of so many. Most in this room have, have, have struggled with poverty, uh, have struggled to, to pay the rent, have struggled to, to put food on their table. And, you know, many of you have shared with me all the different kinds of struggles you've had. Some of your struggles with depression and, and mental health issues, uh, uh, especially after tragedies like losing a child or losing your spouse and, and just the, the, just all that that took out of you and, and yet you're here now. You're here claiming that, 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 that Christ is the light that moves you forward. Some of you in this room have been shot at and some of you have been shot. Some of you here have spent time in prison from everything from Drugs to armed robbery to worse. You know, I know I'm not the only one here whose use of drugs led them in a path that led to terrible consequences. But I'm also here to say, when you give your life over to Christ, yes. Christ will make a difference. Yes. Christ can bring you new life. You know, that person that flunked out of school because of heavy drug use is now getting their doctorate. Yes. Praise God. Yes. Praise God. Yes. Once we start to live for Christ, who we were no longer defines who we are. Once we start living for Christ, who we were no longer defines who we are. And that's why this message will endure forever. Because we have been born again. We, have been, we are being remade into the image of Christ. The very reason we're here sitting in this sanctuary is because we believe that Christ has a message for us. Yes. That Christ can do something in our lives. And one of the things He's doing as we sit here together, He's remolding us, remaking us into His image as we fill our lives with His Spirit and the truth of His message. You know, once we were lost... But now we've been found. Once we were in darkness. But now we strive to walk with the light of Christ. And you know what? This message is not going to be silenced. You know, this message is not going to self-destruct. For now, we will shout, Awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, it's not like Mission Impossible. The love of God does not self-destruct. When God speaks, when God works, God goes public. And God goes public in a powerful, world-changing way. The resurrection of Christ is the decisive event in history that demonstrates that God's kingdom is a reality. It is a reality that has been launched here on earth as it is in heaven. The message of Easter is that God's reign, God's new world, has been unveiled in Jesus Christ. And now, each and every one of you are being invited to join in, to come and be a part of what God is doing in your life and in this little part of our community. Amen. Amen. Amen.